Hello everyone, welcome back to My Hero Academia Podfix. I'll be continuing on with the To Find a Home series today. This will be part five of the series, and this fic is entitled To Adopt You. Izuku was pretty sure they were done with the shopping, but he was proven wrong when on Saturday afternoon he was called to the living room. He was confused, and the setup was only barely helping him understand what was going on. Were they going to watch a movie? The couch had been moved so it faced a blank wall. It was likely not to remain so for that long, as a projector was directed at it. He stayed there, standing with his hands in his pockets of his new joggers in puzzlement. Yamada-sensei ushered him towards the sofa, and he took a seat next to his other teacher. Once they were both sat down, Yamada stood in front of the screen, slightly to the side and cleared his throat while fishing a remote control from his sweater's front pocket. He pointed to the wall as he clicked on a button. The first slide of a PowerPoint presentation appeared. Izuku was gaping. Brands and other necessary clothing knowledge. The slide was bright pink with lots of shopping bags, jumping around, a model walking along the bottom of the screen, and different clothes sprinkled here and there around the title. What the fuck? That was Izuku's only coherent thought at the moment. Yamada, though, was grinning widely as he gestured towards the wall proudly like he expected something. There were long seconds of uncomfortable silence until Izuku started hearing slow, unenthused claps at his left. Turning towards the sound, he was met with the sight of his stoic-faced teacher clapping so slowly it sounded more mocking than anything else, if he didn't know the man was genuinely trying to be supportive. He reflexively clapped along and turned back towards the presentation. As it turned out, there were slides after slides of brands, their style, samples of some of their clothing, as well as a short history of the company's ethics and values. The academic setting made Izuku raise his hand slowly before he was even realizing it. Um, this clearly was meant for him, as he assumed. Aizawa had more than enough knowledge on fashion to not need such an intervention, but didn't you already buy me clothes? He questioned. That was the only reason he could think of for such a display, but it hadn't even been 48 hours since they'd gone shopping for new ones. He was literally wearing them right now. A flash of sadness seemed to pass Yamada's face before it disappeared just as quickly as he resumed just as exuberantly as before. That's right, we bought you emergency clothes, but now we need to get you more so that you have some more diversity in your clothing. He was used to his teacher's finger guns, so he slowly lowered his hands when the gesture made it clear that the question had been answered. That didn't mean that he understood, but the man was usually good at realizing that and kept explaining until things started to make sense to his students. It was Saturday, yet he felt like he was at school. But, well, a cool school, with only three people, a couch, chips, when did those get there, and the prospect of shopping. Okay, so he may not be as enthused by that last one as he was by the others, but it was fine. There were snacks. He could deal. It became clear that the man hadn't been impressed by his selection of clothing because brand after brand were being introduced and no plain black apparel was in sight. He could tell right away when some of the brands shown were needlessly expensive through a single look at the layout of their website. It immediately made him wrinkle his nose, something his perceptive English teacher always seemed to notice, as he immediately never decided to linger on those. It seemed like the man had made sure prices weren't visible, though, so Izuku couldn't take that into consideration. He was honestly fine with what he had. It was more than he'd had in a long time, but he knew a losing fight when he saw one. Even Aizawa was despondent on the couch next to him. It was a wonder the man hadn't fallen asleep yet, considering he was using every second of free time to sneak in a nap. He clearly couldn't care less about the topic, yet he was valiantly trying and fighting to stay awake. Why? Izuku had no idea. Still, it made him feel warm for some reason, and he had to pull his mouth back into a natural line because he'd noticed the corner of his lips lifting. Pulling his attention back in front of him, he was met with a brand selling what was apparently streetwear. Blacks, creams, and greens were displayed on the screen, and cargo pants, shirts, jackets, and hoodies. It seemed practical, easy to move in, and kind of cool if he could admit it. It almost seemed military in style, but more casual and with some extra accessories. Yeah. No one was going to be wearing a chain on their belt on a battlefield. It seemed like his interest had been noticed by Yamada, as he was nearly bouncing on the soles of his feet in excitement. He wasn't saying anything, clearly going through a world of effort to keep quiet. Izuku sighed. He wasn't getting out of this without giving something. This looks nice, he surrendered finally. This time, Yamada did jump in joy, whooping the air. 
It made Izuku slightly flinch in surprise, but it wasn't the bad kind. Just unexpected is all. He thought he would get to make his exit after that, but it seemed like he was not free from going through every other brand Mike had compiled. They'd literally gone shopping two days ago, and the guy had three jobs, including a radio host at Put Your Hands Up Radio, as present Mike special every single Friday. That was yesterday. He would have been live all evening and well into the night. When had the man even found the time for this? Did he have a secondary quirk that allowed him to store endless amounts of energy? Because it would make so much sense. He ended up breaking his facade only once more when on the screen appeared some shirts with ridiculous words or figures on them. The huff of laughter he let out was involuntary, but he could see the smiles that brought the room's other occupants, so he didn't regret the slip-up. And the warmth only grew. Eventually, Yamada seemed satisfied with what he'd achieved as he brought his hands together after the last brand's presentation and bowed out like an artist leaving the stage. He could as well have been. Could that be considered online shopping? Because that was way more fun than he expected it to be. His teacher dramatically let himself fall onto the couch on Izuku's free side and dramatically leaned into the teen's space, resting against his shoulder in a way that couldn't be comfortable. Well, kiddo, I think I have an inkling as to what you might like, so I'll be doing some shopping online, and I can show you, see what you might think. I thought you might want to avoid going back to the mall. The kid shuddered at the simple mention of it. Hell on earth. Malls, they were hell on earth. Yeah, that's fine. More than fine, actually. Yamada was now his savior, and he owed the man a life debt. Aizawa got up to go lay down and take up the extra length of the other couch. There was the nap that he should have been having already. Instead, he'd been stuck here looking at pictures of clothes. Not Izuku's idea of a good time. Definitely not his homeroom teacher's, either. From where Yamada was leaning against him, Izuku could see his phone screen. He was already looking at trousers in the style Izuku had liked, and saw him put one in the cart almost instantly. Wait, that was way too fat. Don't like this one, kiddo. It seemed the man had felt him tensing, and he was already going back to take the article of clothing out of the order. No! He was only whisper-yelling, mindful of the rest of the underground hero was trying to have around them. It's okay, I just... I thought you decided pretty quickly, is all. He trailed off. Yamada hummed in answer and went back to looking at more clothes, decisively clicking on some before Izuku even got a good look. He clearly knew what he was doing, and Izuku found himself not minding the assertive way of shopping. He could wear anything and not mind, but he trusted his English teacher and he knew that he would get him clothes that would actually look nice. Although he did marry Aizawa-sensei, so maybe Izuku could get away with wearing some ratty stuff, too. He extricated himself from his position on the couch to go grab himself a glass of water when he felt his phone buzzing in his pocket. Incoming call. Midoriya Inko. Answer. Deny. He wasn't entirely sure what he would do yet, but he went back to his room without looking up from the screen, like the call would disconnect if he did for even a second. He didn't even answer anyway. The call hadn't lasted long enough for him to decide what he wanted to do. He considered it some more. On one hand, he wanted to say he really didn't care what his mother was calling about, but he knew, and he was curious about the details. He needed to apologize for getting caught and getting them both into trouble. She wouldn't be happy, but it didn't matter. He'd stopped caring what that woman said a long time ago. He pressed the button to call back. The line rang three times before connecting. Izuku was holding his breath, waiting for a sound, a word, something. Izuku? The call of his name made him relax. His mother didn't often use it, didn't often talk to him at all, actually, but it felt normal, natural. He let out the breath he had been holding and perked up slightly. Hey, Mom. He started in a soft voice, one he barely ever used anymore. I'm not your mother. The voice was cold, hard and cutting. Don't call me that. Ah, that was more like it. That's the kind of call it was, of course. Why else would she call him for? It's not like they ever exchanged pleasantries or made small talk, after all. Where had he even gotten the idea that she could be calling about his well-being from? She hadn't cared about him for ten years. She wasn't about to start now. Inko, he corrected himself. She'd probably just gotten out of custody after being arrested for kicking him out. She clearly wasn't about to invite him over for a cup of tea, unless the tea was poisoned, probably. What the hell were you thinking? She seethed, and Izuku instinctively hunched into himself like he was protecting himself from the outside world, yet it wouldn't help him with the device that he was still holding against his ear. I tell you not to get caught, and what did you do? You get caught. How hard is it to go to school and keep your mouth shut? 
Although, I guess you did always have trouble with that. It seems like I wasn't able to get it off of you as well as I thought I had. She's sneering cruelly now, but he can hear her taking a few deep breaths, seemingly attempting to get a hold of herself. What the hell happened? She finally asks, more or less normally, although the anger in her voice can still be heard very clearly. He takes a deep breath of his own before answering. My homeroom teacher saw me on patrol. And he'd only just stuttered once, but makes the tears come to his eyes and a sob catch in his throat. He'd tried so hard. He'd been so good. It had been so long since he'd last stuttered. He hadn't even done it once since getting in the same class at UA as Bakugo. Why now? Why was he failing now? It wasn't fair. He gives himself a mental slap for that one. Life isn't fair, he knows that better than anyone. If he expected fairness or justice, he should have killed himself years ago because it wouldn't come to a quirkless boy. There are times you need to wake up from your dreams and face reality. He thought he'd done that already. It was just bad luck, he says, and would pat himself on the back for the lack of stutter in his sentence if it wasn't the bare fucking minimum. Nothing to be proud of here. Well, your bad luck got me in handcuffs. He hears her exhale deeply once, and the conversation doesn't seem to be over, but silence stretches for so long that he wonders if he should be answering in some way. He doesn't have the time to, though. Where are you right now? She asks, and it makes a rock sink at the bottom of his gut. He's never felt this kind of dread before. Oh, no. He'd gotten comfortable. Excited. Happy with the food and Yamada-sensei's bright energy and Aizawa-sensei's dry humor, and with having things bought for him, things he didn't even need, just because they wanted to do it for him. Just because they were good people who didn't care about his lack of a quirk. Aizawa's napping on the couch in the other room, while Yamada had probably sprawled on the other couch now that he'd left, but he knew if he went back he'd immediately make room for him and ask him his opinion about this shirt or that sweater. He wanted to get what was sure to be heaps of useless clothes he'd switch every day just to get to wear them all, even the ones he hated. Even if Yamada got some of the most awful clothing he'd ever scowled and seen as a joke, he'd put on the bright pink cat throwing up a rainbow while sparkly fairies and unicorns of all colors flew around. It was horrible. He wanted it. He wanted it if they got it for him. He wanted the kindness and the clothes and the food and the laughs and maybe one day he could even get a little bit, even a tenth was fine, even a hundredth would do, of the love they shared. Anything he could get. How had he gotten so greedy so quickly? He couldn't afford that. He couldn't get used to kindness. It wouldn't last. He thought he'd learned to not yearn for things he couldn't have, things he didn't deserve. At my homeroom t teacher's house... He managed to get the last word out in one go, but his breath is catching and he can feel the panic attack coming on. No, it had been so long. It had been so strong for so long and he was not going back there. He forced himself to straighten up, take a deep breath and push it all down, down, down. The world came back into focus and he was just fine. His heart was beating a little faster than it should, but he was still in control of himself. It was fine. He could see the disgust on his mother's face without even being anywhere near her. Some things you just couldn't forget. The disappointment and resentment in her eyes were now a permanent fixture in the back of his head. He didn't want to go back. He didn't. He didn't want to leave, to go, back to the streets, and oh how he understands why the adults were displeased. If this was the kind of environment a child was supposed to grow up in, the streets would certainly seem like an absolutely horrendous place to live. But it was fine, when you'd never really gotten anything better. When you didn't know what others had. He wouldn't be able to go back now. He'd beg on his knees and cry and plead and supplicate for the chance to stay here just a day longer. He'd do the dishes and the cleaning and the cooking and the laundry and he'd massage their shoulders, bring them drinks, straight to their hands and whatever it took for them to keep him. They couldn't leave him. They couldn't. He couldn't give up what they'd just given him no matter what, and he'd only just gotten here. He'd just worked himself back into a panic attack, but he held his breath for as long as he could before letting it out slowly and repeating as many times as needed to feel in control again. Whatever, his mother's voice rang again. It doesn't matter. I signed my parental rights away, so just lose this number. Don't contact me. Don't bother me again. Lord knows you've done enough of that already. He wants to ask when he ever did that, outside of existing something he had no hand in. 
Although, well, he guessed he had no hand in creating his life, but it had been his choice to keep it until now. She'd probably seen the figures when he was little and hoped that he'd be dead by sixteen, like most other quirkless kids were, so she wouldn't have to do it herself and be charged with murder. Although the court would have been understanding considering his condition. It must be so hard to care for people like him, mustn't it? In all meanings of the word, he doesn't get the chance to answer before she hangs up, and there it is, his very last conversation with his mother. He slowly lowers the phone from his ears and looks down at the screen. It's hard to see with how hard his hand is shaking, but he can make out the words he was looking for. Call duration, 2 minutes, 37 seconds. Had it been that short, it felt like forever and yet no time at all. He plans on slowly sinking to his knees, but his body doesn't comply and he just falls down. He grips the edge of the bed with his free hand and focuses on breathing deeply. Keep it away. Keep it away. Don't have a panic attack. Don't ruin all the progress you've made already. It doesn't matter. She doesn't matter. You'll be a hero. You have to be a hero. You can't break over this. This is nothing. You are nothing. He chokes on his next breath. He tries to be quiet, but it obviously doesn't work because Yamada is knocking on the door just seconds after. He breathes in deeply. Control. You're fine. Everything is fine. Don't cause any problems. You can't bother them if you want to stay here. Everything all right, kiddo. Valiantly, he pushes away the panic, stomps on the shaking of his limbs, and he arduously gets to his feet, puts a smile on his face. He makes his way to the door slowly, casually. He isn't even far from it. He can hear his teacher's intake of breath, about to call for him again, but he opens the door before he gets to. He has what he knows is not a perfect smile on his face. His self-control still needs to be worked on, it seems. He's let himself get overly emotional, but he knows it's good enough for nearly everyone. His smile is so wide his eyes are crinkling and he's sure his dimple is showing. Is everything all right, Sensei? Two mistakes, and one already, and he just opened the door, too. He wants to smack himself in the face. The words are too casual for the smile he's sporting, and he isn't supposed to call his teachers by their titles while he's in their home. Get it together. Get it together. Get it together. He doesn't know what face he's making, because between one second and the next, Izuku's being cradled against a warm chest, and there's a hand in his hair. He's being swayed slowly from side to side, while he can hear a calming hum right against his ear, and he feels it in his chest, of the man that's holding him as well. He tries to talk, to say something. He doesn't even know what, but he can't. He spies Aizawa at the end of the corridor. Oh no, he woke him up, and he needs his rest. He's working so much, and here Izuku is being a bother already, and he can't, because they're going to leave him, send him back to the streets. He doesn't want to go back to the streets. It's cold, and empty, and lonely. He's scared, and the next breath he tries to take doesn't make it into his lungs. He's choking on air, breathing so quickly that no oxygen is making its way into his lungs, and he knows what he's supposed to be doing. In for four, hold for seven, out for eight. But he can't. He can't. He's trying, he swears. He is trying, but he just can't breathe, and... There's arms squeezing him, and a melody being sung in his ears, and he can feel another person rubbing his back, and he knows Aizawa Sensei's asking him for five things that he can see, but he can't speak, and he's doing so badly, but he knows if he keeps thinking that it'll just get worse, so he pulls his mind away and focuses on the song. It takes a while. Actually, it takes a long while, and eventually there's dark on the edge of his vision, and his legs are shaking. He's been deprived of oxygen for far too long to be able to keep standing for much longer. But then, the one of the arms that's around him is leaving his back, and all of a sudden he's being picked up and carried. Yamada sits them on the couch, with Izuku on his lap, and he shouldn't be, but he's lifting his arms already and wrapping them around the man as he hides his face in the crook of his neck. Eventually, though, through the humming and the swaying and the holding, his breath evens out. He's still out of it, though. He knows that, after an attack this bad, he'll be lethargic for at least a half an hour. He doesn't care right now, though. He's warm, and he's being held, and there's a hand rubbing his back, and he's letting out a sigh of comfort before he realizes it. Aizawa's back in his line of sight now, and he's holding out a cup of what seems to be tea for him. Drink it, Midoriya. If this were school, it'd feel like an order, but here the voice is soft, and it's clearly a request, an offer rather than an obligation. 
He realizes then that he's sitting on the lap of his homeroom teacher's husband, but when he tries to move, he's being soothed and cradled back into position. He can't say he minds. So he holds out a hand for the cup, but his arm is still shaking, so there's no way that he won't spill any. He's about to retract his hand with an apology, but Hazawa's pressing the mug into his hand, with his own wrapped around it as well. Steadily, he brings the cup to Azuka's mouth and lets him take slow sips. Once he's done, the mug is taken from him, and his teacher sits next to him so Azuka's legs now rest on top of his lap. It's comforting somehow. He snuggles closer to his other teacher and closes his eyes. He doesn't know if he falls asleep, but when he opens his eyes, he knows Aizawa definitely is asleep, on Yamada's free shoulder. The man lets out a huff when he feels Azuku shifting, sending him an amused smile and a roll of his eyes at his husband's expense. It brings a smile to Azuku's face, too. He knows how easily the dark-haired teacher has woken up, so he gets up as slowly and stealthily as possible. He's pretty good at it, but not good enough, as by the time he comes back from the bathroom, the man is yawning and blinking his eyes open. He meets Yamada's gaze, and he knows what's coming. A talk, for sure. Maybe some new rules, or they'll ask him to leave, but that's the worst-case scenario. And considering how nice they'd been, it wasn't the most likely. It just didn't make it any less scary, though. He takes a seat opposite them. Aizawa is still blinking his eyes open, but he's awake, leaning against his husband's shoulder. Yamada gives him an encouraging smile, so Izuku stops his fidgeting and takes a deep breath instead. My mom, Inko, called. He pauses. Hopefully she was allowed to do that or she'd get into more trouble, although it's her own problem now. She said she signed away her parental rights, he shrugs. Sorry. Yamada looks sad, and even Aizawa is straightening up from his position, confused but serious. What are you apologizing for, kiddo? You didn't do anything wrong. He breathes out and just gestures to everything around him. Him, his reaction, the bother, the disturbance, just disrupting the household he had been graciously invited into. He expects Yamada to be the one to answer, as he was the one leading most of the discussions anyway, but he only furrows his eyebrows, and Aizawa answers instead. Midoriya, panic attacks happen, especially after being told something like that. There's nothing to apologize for, although this was a pretty serious one. Does it happen often? He's clearly worried, and Izuku knows that he's probably kicking himself for not noticing the signs that Izuku never let show. He vehemently shakes his head. It hadn't happened in a while, since sometime in middle school. I'm pretty good at keeping them away. I just slipped up here. He stops himself from apologizing at the last second, but he knows his teachers notice his mouth opening to say more. They were clever enough to guess what he'd been planning on saying, too. The men look at one another in silent communication, but it doesn't last long before Yamada is hesitantly bringing it up. Shoda and I think that you might want to consider therapy. He takes a deep breath, ready to explain and explain why that's not a bad thing. You've already been through a lot, more than some people go through in their lifetime, actually, and therapy is helpful to everyone, even people who don't think they need it. Shoda and I go every month, more often if we're working on difficult cases. Izuku can't say he's happy about it, but if it's what they want, he'll do it. He sighs, but nods. They seem surprised by his easy acceptance. Honestly, he definitely wouldn't have agreed so readily this morning, but that was before he realized that he wanted to stay. He slumps into the pillows, and he can't see from the corner of his eyes. His teachers are exchanging another look, much longer this time. It ends when they reach for one another's hand, and they share a small smile. On his homeroom teacher's face, it Looks like a softening of the features and the smallest uptick of the corner of his mouth. On his English teacher, it's wide and bright and happy, but it's not one of his present Mike smiles. It's more human, more real. It has emotions behind it. Midoriya? That was Yamada again, but he had his shoulder squared, a serious tone in his voice, and a death grip on his husband's hand. Izuku straightens up immediately. He wasn't going to cry. He wasn't going to have a panic attack or scream or yell or do anything but smile and thank them for taking him in the last few days. It was more than he deserved, anyway. His smile is on his face already, ready for the act he was about to pull. Shoda and I will keep on fostering you, obviously, but fostering does still mean that CPS can pull you out of here if they want to, although they have no reason to here. He sends a worried look towards his husband. 
They all know Izuku's quirklessness is going to be a problem here. Well, it's a problem everywhere, really, so it's not unexpected, but it's the first time they're going to really be confronted with the reality. He could be taken from his teachers simply because they think that he doesn't deserve to be with two pro heroes, or that the place is too good for him, or that a quirkless person has no business attending UA. Anything, really. So, if you're willing, we could adopt you. Izuku had never heard the confident man sound so unsure, and he's even backtracking immediately to mitigate the words. Not that you have to accept or anything. We'd totally keep you even if you don't want us. We don't want to force you. It's just, if you want to, we, like, totally could. Yamada is rubbing the back of his neck awkwardly, avoiding Izuku's gaze who's staring gapingly at the man. Aizawa, Shota, snorts at his husband, and he earns himself an elbow to the rib in retaliation that makes him gasp. He glares playfully at his significant other before softening and directing his gaze at Izuku. We'd love to have you, if you'll have us, he adds. Izuku is glad that he said something, because otherwise it would have felt like only Yamada wanted to do this, even though he knew no one could push the underground hero into doing anything he didn't want to. But... Why? It's said in a whisper, with his hands holding his knees tightly, and his eyes riveted to them. It was awkward, and he was embarrassed by the question. He didn't even know why he was asking it, when he knew full well he wanted this. "'Because you're our kid,' Aizawa says with a kind gaze. It quickly leaves him when he takes another elbow to the ribs and is back to glaring at his husband, who clears his throat. "'What Shota means?' The last word is drawled out with a displeased look at said man before he turns his attention back to Izuku. "'Is that you're a great kid. You're smart and kind and strong and brave, and you deserve better than what you've been handed so far in life. And we'd like to be the ones to give it to you if you'll have us.' We'd love to have you. We'd love for you to be our son. His eyes are so honest, so raw and true, and even Aizawa's perking up on the side of the couch, looking intently at him like he couldn't wait for his answer. He doesn't give one. He does something that he hasn't truly done in too long. He cries. All right, everyone, this concludes part five of the To Find a Home series. Part six will be next, and as always, thank you all so much for listening.